Okay, so we will be covering these topics today. Um, just key areas of control, general overview. We'll definitely go in um, a couple couple steps deep into reporting um, due to the nature of reporting, which is pretty um, customized. You know, each library usually needs different things. Um, we're going to go a couple things deep. I'll definitely show you where to get additional help and get additional training um, if you need, you know, if you want to kind of use this as a jump off point to go deeper. Um, so I'm going to do everything live here. So let me just go right over here to my live environment. And um, because this is more of a generic training, we're not going to be using any one specific. Um, we're just using the discus entry point, which I would also then now assume that since most of you, majority of you, um, are probably not using this as your entry point. Correct me if I'm wrong. You probably have your own A to Z database page, your own, um, hopefully you have a, um, your own access uh, search box on your pages into your um, smart search or discovery search or whatever you end up calling it. Calling it. Um, so if you're chatting to me, I'd love to see that answer. If you're not, if you are using this page as your entry point, um, then you can go to the top of your screen now and the WebEx menu bar will drop down and you can use the chat there. Um, so I'm going to be looking at in real, looking at that in real time. Let me see, I have that box there. Um, so, but I'm using this entry point and I'm going to be using their back end or Discus's kind of controlling or e-admin area, you all have your own access to it. Um, so what we're talking about is like this is disk, this is my backend access. Um, you get a lot of resources from, from EBSCO through Discus and probably some of you are purchasing individually directly from us too. Um, this, just knowing this as a systems administrator, if you are the systems admin person, just knowing that you can quickly isolate your EBSCO stuff to get to it really quickly or just kind of see um, what you have if things are new or um, maybe things you aren't pointing to, you want to test them out, here is a URL for you. So search.ebscohost.com in an IP recognized building will get, to, get you to your version of this page which quickly isolates your EBSCO stuff. Um, also this page may show up for your users if you um, uh, have a timeout issues or network issues, authentication issues, sometimes you see this and people are like, ooh, I don't know, I don't know why we see that, but, um, but this is something, this is just my back end way of getting in. So, oh, <laughs> so I'm going to be using discovery um, from this page and then I'm going to be looking at um, the back end and some of the controllers for it. So when I first log in to EBSCO admin, the URL eadmin.ebscohost.com, um, every library has access to this. That doesn't mean every librarian has access. That just means that every library should have, um, has their own version of this. Um, if you are a librarian in this class and you don't have your, you know, you should, you think you are the main one that should have um, access and you don't, well then make a note right now and we'll get you, you know, we need to get you the support URL or the support um, email and we will, make, you know, allow you to have access. Also, if you want to add access to people, maybe you have student workers that you want to help run support, run reports, or maybe you have a new um, acquisitions librarian that's going to be managing um, your, your title level holdings and you want them to have access to maybe just this, you know, so you can set up permissions to see either the whole thing. So I want to mention that because maybe you do have access, but when you log in, you don't see all of these things and maybe you should. So pay attention to that. Um, there are permissions um, and so you can, you know, either remove permissions or, or give permissions to anyone that you would like to have accessing this in your library. And again, mostly it's going to be running reports if you don't set those up um, already to be automated, which you should. Um, and then, but I think it, since 
everyone, I believe, in, in this class has discovery, has a version of discovery, you can also be using holdings management to, to um, manage your title level holdings along with adding and removing databases from discovery um, that will then build your discovery experience and keep it uh, fresh and um, up to date with the resources that you own. So any questions at all, please go to the top of your screen and click on the chat button. So the structure is when you first log in, you're looking at your site. Um, usually you're not going to have a drop down like we do here unless you are um, a top level kind of consortial. And even sometimes if you have um, multiple library branches, these, you know, you may be the top level consortium and your branches may be underneath you. So it doesn't necessarily mean to be top level like Discus. You could be a little mini consortia in our mind with multiple branches. Um, so I have my site code and I have a group. My group is, um, I could have different groups for different reasons. Your main group is the default group that you land on and that is your live environment. So if I do want a test environment, if I'm gonna be changing um, a lot of things in the front end, like let's just take you know, your, your smart search for instance, you're gonna be changing logos and um, possibly adding you know, different resources and just trying to really tweak it a lot. Maybe you wanna make a test group to put that in to play around with before you roll it out live. So anything in your main group is gonna be your live so groups are holders of profiles and profiles are just holders of databases. And if you look, I'm gonna backtrack and go here. So this really is your front end of your profile. So if you kind of look at that, um, this is a more front end visual view of this drop down list here. So I have auto repair and automate and business searching and so on. And so when I see all these different things, um, these are holders of databases, right? Now, some of these could be uh, old and just kind of empty shells of things. Um, some of them could have been something that I trialed and so on. They don't all necessarily have to be active and live. And if you do want to uh, set up a time with me to clean these up um, on your site, then we can do that because you, you, over the years, this can kind of get a little bit out of control. Even if you just renamed some things um, you know, to like Z so that they'll go to the bottom so that your top kind of uh, profiles are, are at the top and then the ones that you don't use are at the bottom. But profiles are holders of databases. Why do you need different profiles? Um, one is for different interfaces. So EBSCO Discovery is an interface. You're calling it um, Smart Search. Uh, Automate is a different interface. Um, EBSCO Host. So if searching individual databases are, is a different interface. So when you're making changes or, or when you're trying to, you know, figure out where to start is kind of what do you want to do? What do you want to change? So we're talking about today, we're talking about the smart search. So I'm actually, I think the correct one is this one here. So this, this uh, account even has multiple discoveries. So it really can be confusing, especially if you're brand new walking into it, or even if you're not, um, that, you know, like which one really is the live one? Maybe you're using multiple lives. Um, you wanna make sure if you are gonna go through the effort to change things, or also when you're running reports, it's good to understand, you know, why maybe some of these things aren't being used, or maybe they are getting used, you know, where are they coming from and what are they? So you'll see these same profiles when you're running reports. Um, so I'm going to just focus on, you know, on my um, discovery here. Um, and so then after I choose the correct profile, anything underneath here is what I am then affecting change on. And when I'm in my live group, that change can happen in a matter of a few minutes. So that's why I said if you're doing a lot of changes, maybe make a test group, do your changes, and then copy it over, you know, between semesters or at a quieter time in your library. But um, for the most part, um, a change that I'm doing, maybe adding or removing a resource. Uh, but let's, let's do a search in the front end and then I'll talk about some of the key areas of control. So 
I, I want I, ch I would challenge you all to do to look at your settings after this session or if you're a super good multitasker do it now um, but some of the key things that I first talk about anytime I look at discovery is what are your search settings um, a lot of you haven't really looked at those so I'm just going to open up this search options box I could also go to advanced search just to see what my search settings are and I haven't changed anything right I just want to see what is pre-selected for the user? Most likely, the majority of your users, once things are pre-selected for them, they're not really messing around too much with these. And that's why it's important for you as the master librarian, you know, as the controller, to make sure that these settings are the best for your users. And you should revisit these settings, um, you know, once a year, twice, or, you know, every other year, whatever it is. You shouldn't have made a conscious decision about what's going on. Um, so my defaults right now for this individual, you know, for this for this entry point, yours are all going to be different. I could bet money that no matter how many people are in this class, everyone is going to have something different because at time of setup, you requested these things or maybe you changed them after. Um, but right now what this system is doing and let me just go ahead and do a search and I'll just do this Bitcoin mining kind of been Bitcoin's been in the news a lot lately and I just want to know more about this topic so I did my my two keywords here it could have been three or four but if it's more than one and I have this find all my search terms as a default what it's doing is it's ending my search terms do you like that? I don't know. Every library is going to be different. Um, so I'm ending my search terms. That means I'm going to get more results, right? Where does it look for those two keywords, ending them? Um, that's the first question I want to answer. So number one, it's going to look in the title of the article, in the source field, in the author field, in the um, subject field and it weighs the subject field heavily heavy heavier than any of the other fields that I'm just discussed and it's also looking at within the abstract of the article remember it's anding those search terms and sometimes there are hidden subjects too so a lot of times the subjects the main subjects will be shown but there are additional subjects that are kind of in the back end metadata um, so it's looking at that and it's saying, okay, if I find those words, I'm going to put them in this list. Then what else is it doing? So it's also saying, well, huh, you have this setting called apply equivalent subjects. It's also then using a mapping table that we have that says, okay, Bitcoin mining is mapped to this concept. This concept is then mapped to subject specific headings within specific databases. So if you if this adds anything to your result list, it's going to be very, very relevant results in there. And I would say that this is a good thing. Librarians love this, and they're the ones that said, hey, turn it on um, for everyone in discovery. So we did a vote, and everyone said, yes, this is something we want. And by the way, this setting most likely will not be on when you search individual databases using eHost. So these are the kind of things that if you see something in one of your EBSCO resources, why not, and you like it, why not make sure that all of your EBSCO resources then are either maybe searching the same or using some of the same limiters, expanders, and so on. Okay, so don't just think about your discovery. Think about your other main controller of every individual database that you may search on your A to Z database page, which is using the EBSCO host profile. All right, so um, the next thing it's doing is it's also saying, wow, even if I don't find these keywords in that top level metadata, abstract, title, subject field, it doesn't matter because I still want you to look within the full text of every article that you have access to. And that's not just EBSCO articles either. That is, and that's going to be ebooks too. Um, that's a lot of our partners. Um, do give us their full text so that it can be searched. We just can't serve it up to you. We have to point you to their, um, let's just say, Gale, you know, so we can search um, a lot of the Gale metadata in Academic OneFile, but we cannot serve it to you 
it, it wants you to, you know, to go over to their interface. We can show you this, and then we can show you the link to go over. So this is also adding a lot of resources. So do you have this turned on? This was a default when Discovery was first um, rolled out to you, most likely. And uh, if it's still on and you're getting complaints or you're getting comments like, oh, wow, Discovery gives me too much, my smart search gives me too much, this is one of those simple things that you could either turn off on the fly, watch it go down from 6,200, look there. I still have plenty of results for this, but I don't have 6,000 anymore. Um, so you can either turn that off altogether, all the time, or you can turn it off on the fly. And then I do have a limiter. The limiter then says, well, even though you're finding all these things for me, then only show me um, what I actually have access to. So if I did remove this, I'm then adding in abstract only items. But by default, this, this version of Smart Search is limiting to full text. So we're talking about, I think the reason why I start with this is because I think making changes in this area um, is almost, is the number one, you know, it's very high up there. I have two number ones. One is what you're searching. and one is how you're searching. So there's really, there's no, you have to make this right, and then you also have to make what you're searching in the background, which is either going to be called your content provider list, your databases list. Um, Discus renamed this to I want to use. So this is then the content or the databases, the resources of where these 6,000 or 1,000 items are coming from. So this is also totally under your control. If you have not looked at this, if you're getting non-English language resources that you don't want, or you do want to add in non-English language resources, and so on. If, you, if you're not maintaining your databases within Discovery, then you're really missing out on, um, you know, on searching what you own. So now that I've shown you those two key areas, where are the controllers in the background? So in once I choose my correct profile, my searching tab is going to be where mostly all of those pre-search settings are. So that search mode of anding um, is going to be located right here. And I would challenge you all to click in that search mode and see what your default is. Look in the front, you know, and make sure that a lot of you may be doing this Boolean, um, which is a near five-word search. Make sure it's not this near zero, that's forcing people to put quotes um, around things. I've seen this before and I'm like, ooh, no wonder you're not getting very many results. So the, de the kind of generic default for if you are using that Boolean phrase is a near five word search. I'm gonna show you what that means in the front here. So instead of ending your search terms, your default may be, you know, you're only gonna have one or two defaults. You're gonna have the Boolean or you're gonna have this. No one has ORing and no one has smart searching that I've ever seen. So if you do that Boolean phrase, it's going to be a tighter search because think about it. Now I'm not ending my search terms. I'm saying these words need to be near five words of each other. It doesn't matter the order. If I'm mining Bitcoins or if I'm Bitcoin mining, that doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if there's four words in between these two, the near five word search. So it's going to find those items if it's in that article, um, in the title, in the um, you know, and in the subject field, and so on. But already, I'm getting you know a lot less results. I also removed that other expander of searching within the full text. But even then, I would get less results than that initial four or six thousand. Um, so I have a question that I'll answer. Uh, let me go back over here. So your search options is where you can control that. Um, that, And I think this is very important for everyone to discover. And if you notice, so this kind of answers um, the question that I just got. Well, look at my other profile. So remember, I have this e-host. Whatever, um, whatever your name of profile is here doesn't really matter. What's in parentheses is really what is important because that is a code and that doesn't change. A lot of people can change the description, but they don't change the code. So find your e-host in parentheses. And this is your other main controller of your searching, you know, of all of your individual EBSCOhost search 
So if I want to change something like, um, you know, if I want to change any setting or check any setting, I actually have to look in my different profiles. Um, so that's the answer to that. So if I want to actually um, make that change in discovery to I want to use, and I have multiple discovery versions like Discus does, like they have a kids version and a teen version and so on, they will have to go into their individual profiles and change these things. If you want to change, if you want to see what's going on in EBSCO Host and, and your discovery EDS, and make sure those things are a little closer together, better for training or for teaching it, um, better for understanding it for libraries and users, or maybe you want to keep them totally separate because they are two separate things and two separate ways to search. Um, you know, you will have to go in each one and look. So your searching tab, the only other thing that I, you know, kind of the other thing that I really, really talked about on this page is down here under your limiters and expanders. And so I think that those things right there, if you just manage those things, choose to either turn on full text or choose to turn on this one available in library collection, which usually is more than what full text will give you because we do own items that aren't full text, um, but it would show you what you own. Um, so these two things are similar, but a little different. Uh, so if you do wanna choose one of those things as a default, it's gonna limit your results and this is how you would then, you know, choose it. So the limiters and then the those expanders. So if you did decide, you said, hey, I've been getting, you know, I've been getting comments for years about, oh, it's too much. Well, this is the first thing I would turn off. And the thing is, is with this, this is available that also search within, that is always going to be available on your advanced search screen. So, um, and I think on the basics, let's look on the basics. I just open up this search options here. Yeah. So on the basic search screen, I also have, you know, if you did want to uncheck it by default, you also have this available. And I tell librarians, really, the only time I would invoke that on a regular basis, if you, you know, if you do turn it off, is when you get zero to few results. So zero to few results, I have my keyword up here. I don't want to change my wording. I can't change it, maybe. Um, I can do this, and most likely you're going to get more items added to your list. Um, that are talking, you know, that use your keywords somewhere. So it's not like you're taking it away, you're just on, you know, you're just removing it um, as a default on is what you're doing. So any changes here, wording changes, if you think, you know, a little bit of on-screen instruction, and that's what we saw in that um, I want to, uh, let me just do this, um, what was it called? I want to search, I want to, so yeah, I want to use. So this is a wording change. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So here, um, I'm those searching settings, those are my pre-search settings typically. Databases, what I'm searching. So remember, I said this, doing this one time and kind of making sure that's good. You don't have to really do that all the time. You're not gonna be changing your search settings all the time, but you may be adding and removing resources uh, often. Um, this does show you that you have some kind of custom catalog in here. This should be kept updated. Um, you know, as you see, we make whatever you send us as your catalog, we make into a database. So now you are responsible for keeping that updated um, and those records updated. The same as we are responsible for keeping Academic Search Premier updated. And then if you look at, you know, biography and context, which is not an EBSCO resource, um, you know, whoever we get that from, and I think that might be a Gale or, yeah, then, um, you know, they are responsible for getting us those records and so that we can keep that updated. And just a glance here, so this is what you have enabled, so that means this is what's turned on for this profile to search. Um, if I never ever want to have this as a yes, so if yours is yes, please turn it to no, and please talk to me about that, because that, just talk to me. This is like the self-destruct. You don't want to allow every bit of um, partner content that we partner with to be turned on in your system. But if you look, this one, let's see, this one has a fair amount of databases turned on. Um, if you typically, if it's a three word code, that's gonna be an EBSCO resource. If it's, if it's prefaced by EDS, it's gonna be a partner resource. So this is definitely from Gale. Um, 
And so that's, you know, so when you look at those things, it may be an easier way to understand, like, well, which ones aren't EBSCO? Um, because there, well, a lot of them are named the same, right? Pretty close together. But if I do want to add, if I want to remove something from here, we no longer get Britannica, or I want it out of my EBSCO um, searching discovery experience, I'm just going to turn it off, boom, and then hit submit at the bottom, okay? Not going to do that, but I am going to show you then where's the rest of the stuff. So the rest of the metadata, the partner metadata that we get is actually over in the disabled area. And this is, if you have not been maintaining this on your own um, for in your system, this is definitely something that you are maintaining because we don't know, EBSCO doesn't know as a company, um, if you're adding and removing non-EBSCO resources. And sometimes even your EBSCO resources, I would just double check to make sure that those things were enabled and turned on if you get new items, okay? So I went over to the disabled area, and now I'm gonna show you, this is the knowledge base of all of our, our databases, along with all of the partner databases. Remember, this is top-level metadata. This doesn't mean you have full text access to it. It just means that the metadata is there. If you subscribe to it, you can turn it on, and then create, you know, we will help you to create a link to then go out to these resources. So you can see that this list is much longer than what we have enabled, and it should be, because this is everything. Um, but this is the list that you can go back and view and hopefully find what you've, you know, what you've purchased or what you're currently not searching, but own, um, and then turn it on. So I'm looking and I'm still, see, I'm still just now down to the end, and I'm going to have at least three more pages to go. So this is where you're turning on resources. Okay, very important and a key area of maintenance. Um, your viewing results, and I'm just I'm trying to go a little faster for time-wise, but please ask any questions, make any comments. Everyone's just kind of sitting back going, hey, I don't, <laughs> hopefully learning, uh, but definitely ask questions, okay? Because I'm I want to make sure that, you know, I'm not just flying by these things. Um, and then viewing results is actually kind of anything on this page that you might want to change. So, you know, we noticed this was changed, right? So it's not, it's, this is a, a customized area. Um, so if you do see something on this page where you want to add or remove some items over here, you want to do something with this AP videos if you haven't already done so, um, maybe you just want to close this down so that it hides because you don't have many items over there. Um, so anything like that can be changed on that viewing result. So think about that. That is after you hit um, the entry button. So this is before you hit enter. What are those search settings? What you're searching on your databases tab? And then after. So that nice view. Some of the other settings you might want to check is, you know, this is allowing 20 results per page. You can turn on up to 50. I would suggest turning it at least to 20, 30, 40. Um, the default's going to be 10. So if you've never changed it, probably in your EBSCO host too, you're going to only have 10 items showing. So why not jump over into your profile that you want to change, go to viewing results, um, and change this here. Boom, so that's it. Within a matter of a few minutes, now your users have a little bit of better experience of not only having a minimum of 10. Um, so I do have a question and I'll stop for a minute. This is also where you can see that source type label has been edited. Let's look at that. Um, I didn't notice that earlier, but yeah, so there it is. So I want to see, that's the source type, I'm sorry, and then, I want to use is the databases tab or the content provider tab. So I want to see used to say source type and they just, you know, added that little on-screen instruction. And then if I scroll down, I want to use used to be that content provider label, which no one knows what that is. So at minimum, put databases there or put some other kind of on-screen instruction. So I do have a question. Um, so some of the profiles sound like databases, so they say they're, okay. So what you're saying is when I look at my profile list, I also have 
history reference center, literary reference center, um, novelist, points of view, which are individual databases. So you are correct. I wish I could give you a prize. So profiles are holders of databases. Sometimes the profile is created just for the database special, right? So I would say history reference center, special, different beyond EBSCO host, right? EBSCO host, you just have that search box, it's blue, um, and you have your limiters, expanders, whatever. Everyone's used to that plain EBSCO host search box. History reference center, literary reference center, novelist points of view, science reference center, small, all these reference centers have their own individual, um, are, are a database, so you're right. Um, this is a database by itself and it can be searched in EBSCOhost. All the data is none of it will be missing. You can still search it. But if you choose to search it in its own um, profile, then you get that specialized or it's in its own interface, you get that specialized interface. Let's see if this will come up here. Yep. So would you prefer to search Small Business Reference Center using this um, where I can see the visual, you know, NOLO books and all that, or would you prefer the Small Business Reference Center to be searched in your e-host? You know, I think the majority of the people would say that they would prefer to see it in that individual, in that specialized um, interface. If you're currently not using those specialized interfaces, um, I can help you to make your URLs. They're already there. They're waiting for you to use. So I can help you to make your URLs um, so that uh, when I turn these two off, so so that you can point to those. Why these are chosen? Um, I was trying to get to that small business reference center, but you get the idea. I mean, you know what EBSCOhost looks like, and it's actually going to be here, or it may be here. Yeah, there it is. So if I just went in there, there it is. Same data not as intuitive view. So hopefully that helped you. So I think we are, um, so I didn't even really get a chance to talk about your publication finder, which is managed here in Holdings Management. This is a very short period of time to talk about all these things, but I just do want to build a little bit of interest on this because it, it really um, dives deep into what you're doing with discovery. Most all of you that have discovery are also have some type of e-journal um, finder that you're calling it or e-thing finder, um, e-books and e-journal or publication finder, or you've left it as the default of publication. So you do have a built-in but separate um, title finder that has nothing to do with who we partner with. It has everything to do with what's known in the world, not just, you know, who EBSCO partners with, but what is known in the world um, as an as something that's accessible online in an e, you know, an e environment. And this is where this here, your publication finder, can be a very, very strong tool for you as a library to see, do I own this item anywhere? And when I say that, I mean some libraries even choose to load their paper holdings. So load your paper journal holdings so that when I go to my publication finder, I can type in any journal name and I'm going to know where I own it. doesn't matter if I get it from ProQuest. doesn't matter if I subscribe individually or directly to it. doesn't matter if I order it through EBSCO Journal Services or it belongs in a database. None of that matters. Do I own it somewhere? This should be the way that you should be thinking about your publication finder. And yes, it is something that you will need to um, maintain because you are the only one, individual libraries are the only ones that know what they purchase and what they drop. Um, so this interface, even though it's tied in with discovery, is different. It's a title level finder. And if I'm looking for titles that have something to do with ethics, how does it know I own these things? It knows it because it's coming from holdings management. So we have a whole class on holdings management. We have a whole class on just, just you know, helping you understand discovery, which includes that, and also reports and statistics too. So let's move on to reports and statistics because it is, we are getting close to the end. 
Um, but I do want to put that kind of that hopefully um, excitement. If you haven't been using holdings management that way or you haven't been maintaining it, no one's touching it, um, or you only think it's EBSCO stuff, no, it's everything, it's a title finder and it should be used that way and it should be maintained. So what's next? Um, now that you've kind of cleaned up your system, you know where, you know, kind of key areas of control, which would be your holdings management and then your customized services, your different profiles. Um, now you're ready to run your reports after, you know, you know what you're kind of looking for. So there's a couple usage reports that are really quick that you can look at that are brand new that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is this standard usage analytics. So if you haven't looked at this recently, this is something that's fairly new. I think it came out, um, what is it? Maybe less than a year ago now. And I think the, the with people with discovery, so once you have discovery, your sessions and your searches went way, way up because discovery automatically pings every single database that you have access to, right, instead of just a manual user going to academic search and doing that search. Discovery searches academic search every single time someone searches and every single search. So these two things are less valuable um, because of discovery, but they're also less valuable because it, who cares if people came in there and did stuff? What did they get? What did they read? Were they able to find things is really what's important these days um, for the majority of libraries. So what I like for this one, the visual, I'm going to just uncheck the sessions. I'm unchecking the regular searches, and I'm even going to uncheck the federated searches because what I want to know is, are my users finding things? And are they reading things? Are they able to do their research? And when I see high abstract and high full text, I think, yes, my users are getting out. When I see link out requests, guess what? This is then linking out. A discovery is getting them to your additional resources. So how many, you know, so it's doing its job. It's getting them out to anywhere, you know, your JSTOR or your Gale or your uh, Britannica, wherever you're going, need to go out to, it's also getting them out to that. Um, so we know, we can tell you where, you know, that we sent them out, but we can't tell you what they did after. So you still, when you're doing um, EBSCO's reports, you still have to do reports in Gale and do reports in your other vendors because those, you know, once we send you out, we don't know if you access full text or not. Um, so this is the cool report also. If you look at this um, login usage, I think this is the one that can actually show you, you know, we have all these statistics all the time that say, oh, um, our users are using mobile more and more. Um, our users are using this new um, uh, browser now, you know, and using uh, Internet Explorer less or using these other browsers less. So um, this actually gives you just a snapshot of how people are accessing your, you know, your probably the majority of your library resources really can, but you know, this is counting just EBSCO stuff. I mean, you can kind of bet if they're, if they're getting to EBSCO, then they're also doing whatever they're doing on their device, they're doing everything. So you can see that for this site, it's uh, mobile's a little lower. I would I would probably assume that yours is going to be higher. Um, but I can see that user ID and password. I have people that are IP recognized and so on. And then my operating systems. And if I wanted to view more or browsers, you're going to see browsers in here that maybe you have never even heard of before. You know, so there's some different browsers here. They really have a lot of detail in here about what people are using and how and what they're using. And look at that in Nintendo um, on their DS. Someone was accessing library resources. <laughs> so um, that is one of the reports and that's under, let me just go back to standard usage and reports. And I know I have maybe about five more minutes I'm gonna go and then I'll probably um, show you where you can go to get more information about taking like a whole class on reports or watching a recording on it. Um, or definitely if you um, have something specific, now is the time to put it in the chat because we're here in the reporting module. Um, if anyone is doing counter reporting, then we do have that capability here. And some of those reports can be helpful. 
let me see if I can get one of the ones for, um, you know, even if you're not doing counter reporting, just it, it can be helpful if you have discovery, just to get an idea, um, like the search clicks report. Let me see. So I think this one here, the result clicks. So you can see, you know, how many people are clicking on that result page. Um, I think this is the one. I haven't done this in a while, but let me just do, uh, just do a short, a very short time to see. And all of these reports, you're going to be um, either downloading, you know, to, to view right away um, or send, you know, or creating the email option. And the email option is then creating for an ongoing report to be sent to you. Okay, if I'm just going to use download right now because I just want to view it right away. So as soon as I create that download, I can see it over here. And it's pretty quickly going to be there. So I can going to open it up. And so I don't know, because this is the consortium, it's probably going to be, yeah, it's going to be a lot. But you can see um, that it's pretty quick. I can get to it pretty quickly. And then I can kind of, I, I can manipulate it then within uh, my Excel spreadsheet to then what I want to know. But the typical other way of doing, of looking at reports, um, and a lot of the ones especially, I'll go ahead and go into the standard usage now. Um, one of the main ones, like if you and I met individually, the, one of the main ones that I would run would be that, in, that um, profile usage report. So we could figure out what profiles, out of all that long list of profiles, which ones are really being used, and we can start to clean that up. Um, but usually, if you want to look at your individual database, um, reports, you know, you're just going to choose your database or your interface, which is going to be how many people are using EDS, how many people are using Expohost, how many people are using that history reference center. Your profiles um, are not necessarily matching interfaces, but any interface, any interface difference. So like, like I mentioned, any of those reference centers are all separate interfaces. EHost, a separate interface. EDS, a separate interface. Um, link activity, this is going to tell you um, where where people are going out to. Um, so you can, this is a good one for you to run when you're using a lot of custom links. Again, you can see where you're sending them to, but you're not going to know what they do after they get there because you're going to have to go to that, um, that vendor and look at their usage. Um, the login usage report is the one that I would use. Um, if you did want to see, you know, how people are logging in, um, I'm, the interface usage is the one that I use to figure out what profiles are being used. If you're a consortium, you're going to pick your site um, and so on. You're always picking your site, you're picking your reporting period, and then you're picking groups. And I think this is a pretty simple interface to use. Um, if you, you're going to see right away, like this is what I do, it's kind of trial and error. You know, so if you if you try something one time um, and run it really quickly, um, let's just not do all sites. Let's just do one. I'm just going to pick my, you know, you're not going to have that choice. Most likely you're just going to have. So if I just do one for this, I'm kind of set it up here. Um, as soon as I, you know, if I do want to save it and create something for later, I'm going to choose that email option. It's going to give me those um, choices. See, so here's my choice if I want it one time, if I want it monthly, and so on. Um, so I would suggest that you but first kind of play around with it, get to, to tweak it and get it perfected, um, create report for download. The second I do that, my download reports are going to be there, and it's going to, I'm going to be able to then access it here, see, you know, see if it's if it's correct, if that's the data that I need, and then um, just rerun it again. You can go back over and it, and then you know, send set that email up, and then your scheduled reports are going to be there. And so when we went to this new reporting module, um, maybe about a year ago now, anything that was scheduled in the past was removed. So um, if you haven't rescheduled your reporting um, in a while, then you know we can. I can help you to either do that or I keep on offering help, 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 because there really is a lot of help. So before I um, show you where that help is, 
which I'll have to end the session and go to back to my PowerPoint. Um, are there any other areas that I didn't talk about, that I didn't discuss, um, that you, you know, you said, well, it's the only reason why I came to learn. So, <laughs> so let me know that now in chat. Um, there's two other things that I want to, I want you to put on your radar uh, for upcoming for, you know, the end of this year. Um, and mo moving forward is one is we are moving to um, from HTTP to HTTPS. What that means to libraries is that on your, um, let's just go back to here, you know, so on your A to Z database page, um, you most likely have all of your URLs are pointing to HTTP, EBSCO, you know, search.ebsco.com, blah, blah. Um, so those, you won't have to, you know, when we do that change, you won't have to change those on your website because we will have redirect in place. So when we make that change, we're going to do it, we said we're going to do it sometime in December now. So if we do it in December, within the first 15 minutes, everything may not work just because, you know, the internet has to catch up. All the networking things on the internet have to catch up. So um, after that, within 15 minutes, things should be working as normal. Um, within two hours, things really should be working as normal. So if there's still some oddities within after that 15 minutes, it'll be fine. Eventually, and I mean like years from now, we'll probably all have to change our, our URLs to point to HTTPS. But this is something that um, is, uh, you know, the redirect will be into play, in place for a very, very long time, okay? It's not something you have to rush and do. Um, the next thing is, and this is going to be take a longer conversation, but it's not going to happen right now, is um, we are getting Google um, authentication integration. So, huh, think about that. Um, so just put that on your radar. We're sending out emails um, to top-level administrators. Um, I just think that it's a game changer. Um, for some people, you know, uh, so and but it will take some changes in the back end, um, and it, it may take some changes in your URL structure to allow for that ability for people to use their Google account to authenticate into your resources. Um, so there's, you know, just again, just a kind of a bug in your ear to think about for later. That functionality is supposed to be announced next month, so that's what I'm saying, which next month is literally in a couple days, right, October. I don't have a date, I don't know if it'll be moved up, but if you do want to know more, you can go to help.edpo.com, and this is not new anymore, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, and just put in a Google authentication. I think that's going to get you the page. And then also, remember, I'm here, um, I am your um, training specialist. Um, here, let me get you that. Yeah, there you go. And um, I'm a trainer, but my official title is Senior Customer Engagement Manager. So whatever you want to write down in your notes is fine. Um, super easy email address, ljones.epco.com. I will be working more and more with um, with Discus and with the state um, to maximize your res you know the resources at the state level. And I would love to work with you also individually um, to you know, again, just to kind of talk about what's coming, what's new, um, and to act, and if you want to meet to do like a health check on your system, especially for those of you that are heavily using discovery, um, uh, that's, that, that's my forte. That's what I love. So um, definitely contact me after the session. I'm, I'm already busy for the next two weeks, so, and probably you are too, <laughs> but anytime after that we can meet. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now. And I'm going to hang out, too, for a little while. So for those of you...